Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. Hi, this is Kurt Repencheck, your host at National Parks Traveler. There was some interesting news from across the national park system this past week. In Utah, at Glen Canyon National Recreation Area, word came that a hiker there had discovered two Spanish coins, possibly dating back to the 13th century. At Grand Canyon National Park, meanwhile, officials have settled on a plan to replace the aging and leaking Trans Canyon water pipeline. In Virgin Islands National Park, uh, almost a year and a half after a hurricane swept through there back in September of 2017, they finally have a new concessionaire to reopen the Cinnamon Bay Campground. But there's lots of debris to be cleaned up before that happens. You can find those and other stories on nationalparkstraveler.org. In this week's show, I talk with Jamie Rappaport-Clark, the president of Defenders of Wildlife, about uh, her organization's view of wildlife in the national park system. I also visit for a short time with Steve Markle from the river running company Oars about the upcoming float season in the national park system. Finally, Erica Zambello concludes this week's episode with another segment from her visit to parks in Alabama. Wildlife today faces a great number of challenges and barriers. There's ever-present development squeezing habitat, climate change that is altering habitats, and human pollution that is poisoning wildlife. Three decades ago, the New York Times reported that places such as Yosemite and Mount Rainier National Parks had lost more than a quarter of the species originally found in those two parks. Smaller park units might have lost as much as 40% of their original species, the newspaper reported. Have things improved or gotten worse? Today we're visiting with Jamie Rappaport-Clark, the president and CEO of Defenders of Wildlife, to get her take on the state of wildlife in the national park system. Thanks for joining us, Jamie. Thank you. So with that brief introduction, what, what's the short story? I mean, do you, do you have a sense that um, conditions for wildlife in the national parks are getting better or getting worse? Well, what I can say with a great deal of definition is that national parks and those really wonderfully robust protected areas are increasingly essential for endangered species. Uh, they're, they're areas of kind of safe haven uh, just by virtue of their expanse and their geography uh, and their protected nature. So I, I guess I would say that, that, that wildlife are certainly protected uh, on these lands, uh, but wildlife is under such siege in our country right now that it's, you know, thank goodness for our national parks. True, they are, they are indeed safe havens, but at the same time, there are some places... Um where development is encroaching on them and even squeezing them and, you know, migration corridors are are struggling. And obviously that presents a a great threat to um, genetic diversity within a particular species as well as a a number of species, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. What, what What we have to protect against is special areas like national parks becoming islands for species, uh, where species can't move beyond these protected boundaries. Uh, where species get kind of trapped within a geographic area that is unnatural for them, and or uh, where uh, it prevents normal life patterns like migration or movement uh, for foraging, breeding, feeding, whatever. So national parks are great safety nets. They're great sinks for species protection, but by themselves, they are going to singularly save biological diversity in this country. No, that's that's true. That's very true. And, you know, I, I guess one of the, the clearest examples present day is what's going on at Isle Royal National Park in Michigan, where recently the Park Service decided to basically import wolves um, because the, the wolf population on the, the island out in Lake Superior had uh, gotten down to, to two animals and, and they were badly inbred, I believe. And so I wonder if, as we go forward in society, if we if something drastic isn't done in terms of maintaining migrational corridors or whatnot, if the National Park Service staff is going to turn into de facto zookeepers with uh, the parks becoming open-air zoos, is that a, a concern that we should be worried about? 
Well, I sure hope not. Um, uh, what we, we don't want, though, you're absolutely correct, is that national parks or the federal land base, national parks, national wildlife refuges, becoming the de facto only place where wildlife are conserved. Because you're right, they will become kind of natural zoos. And that's not uh, either biologically or ecologically or even economically secure. But these lands, national parks in particular, are areas that are important um, jewels. They're important anchors for biodiversity conservation and uh, are essential that they're maintained, that they're supported. I think national parks now um, support more than 600 threatened and endangered species in this country. That's huge. Half of national parks today are home to vulnerable species. That's really significant. But we, your, your line of reasoning is absolutely spot on, that they should not be looked at as an off-ramp or an exclusion, the only places where we should be conserving wildlife. Now, as I was thinking about our conversation today, I just kind of mentally looked out across the, um, the national park system at some of the species and, and some of the issues that are out there. And, you know, you can look at the Florida panther in, in Big Cypress National Preserve and Everglades National Park, and it seems to be doing a, a little bit better than it has in years past. Is, is that safe to say? It's absolutely safe to say. I, I remember uh, the, Nash, uh, the Florida Panther issue quite well. There were, it was a lot like the Isle Royale situation. We were down to very few cats in the wild and relying on those special federally protected land bases in South Florida, we brought in an infusion of genetic material, more cats in, and it was uh, Big Cypress, Everglades National Park, the, the Florida Panther National Wildlife Refuge that provided that stronghold, that toehold for Florida panthers to breed and, and kind of mix the genes up uh, to, to a point where now we're up into the hundreds of Florida panthers and they're moving northward as we'd hoped. Uh, you know, we have all kinds of hopes that that uh, Florida panthers will move up through the panhandle and into Georgia and into parts of their historic range that never would have been made possible if we didn't have the, the national parks and, and wildlife refuge in South Florida to uh, get that jump start going for the Florida panther. But then there are, there are two other predators that uh, perhaps are not doing too well, and that, that would be the red wolf in the southeast and, and the Mexican wolf in the, in the southwest. They seem to be running into um, barriers, whether they're, they're natural barriers or, or even political barriers. Very true. Um, you know, let's juxt- I'll juxtapose the, the, the three big wolf initiatives. Uh, gray wolf return to the northern Rockies was absolutely made possible by the expense of Yellowstone National Park. That, that was one of our greatest success stories and one of our most successful restoration initiatives. Without a Yellowstone National Park, I am pretty certain we wouldn't have the amazing wolf recovery in the Northern Rockies. If you then drop down the Rockies into the, the Mexican gray wolf territory of the Southwest, similar kind of reintroduction, but we didn't have that safe haven, the big Yellowstone Life National Park or National Wildlife Refuge to allow the Mexican gray wolf to get a jump start and get going. And that that recovery program has had some real struggles because it hasn't had the safe space to, to recover, to kind of grow the numbers and to um, kind of repopulate. We move over to the East Coast with the Red Wolf, similar situation to the, to the Mexican Gray, and that uh, the reintroduction of the Red Wolf, which was the precursor to reintroduction of the Gray Wolves in Yellowstone, Idaho, and the Southwest. But, but that reintroduction effort started with the National Wildlife Refuge uh, because it was safe. It was a protected area where it could be a managed reintroduction process. Uh, but as as wolves bulged out of those federally protected areas, they became really targets for not only um, loss but persecution. And so, I think all three of those situations speak to the real significant importance of protected lands for species conservation. 
uh, coupled with that is a real need to kind of educate the, the local constituencies and, and work hard to change the hearts and minds about what it means to restore, in these cases, apex predators back to the wild. You know, looking at the Mexican wolf, um, you've got, um, I believe, the historic habitat extended up into Big Bend National Park and even Guadalupe Mountains National Park. Is is there enough um, combined real estate there, so to speak, that uh, could perhaps find provide that safe haven to, to get a toehold population going? Absolutely. Uh, um, th- th- there's, uh, there is enough federal, federally protected land and Native American tribal land that uh, Mexican gray wolf recovery is a sure win. We, we can make that happen. But coupled with that is the need for coexistence, uh, the need for education, and the need to both address conflicts and increase social tolerance for critters like wolves on the landscape. But the federal land base, uh, coupled with Native American lands, absolutely exists in the Southwest to uh, advanced recovery of Mexican grays. Now, with the, the red wolf, um, they had tried uh, returning them to Great Smoky Mountains National Park, and that met with mixed results. Was that outcome victim of intolerance towards their return? No, that actually was an interesting experiment that I was involved in back when I worked for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I'd like to see that tried again, frankly. Uh, I, I believe the Great Smokies uh, can support wolves and should support wolves. Back then, uh, there was a lot that we didn't know about red wolf recovery, and the the big limiting factor was prey base, and prey base in the Smokies in particular. Uh, That, I think, has evolved in the last couple of decades, and I am a firm believer that the Great Smokies could be a great, uh, important uh, reintroduction site for red wolves, and that's what red wolves absolutely need to be successful. We need to find more places, more protected places for red wolves to be reintroduced and and cultivated uh, towards recovery. Yeah, I think it'd be a a wonderful um, event for um, hikers and backpackers to the the Smokies to have the red wolf return. There's nothing more magical in my mind than uh, a howling wolf at uh, evening or early in the morning. Oh, I couldn't agree more. the, The magic of a wolf howling is something you never forget. No, you don't. We've been visiting today with Jamie Rappaport-Clark, the president and CEO of Defenders of Wildlife. We're going to take a short break now, and we'll be right back. Listener and reader support make National Parks Traveler possible every day of the year. If you enjoy Traveler's content, please consider a donation via nationalparkstraveler.org. The Yosemite Conservancy inspires people to support projects and programs that preserve Yosemite National Park and enrich the visitor experience. The Conservancy funds transformative work throughout the park. The grant's donors support help protect diverse wildlife and plant species and restore the precious habitats they depend on. Grants also support improvements to miles of trails to ensure visitors can safely access Yosemite's wonders. Visit yosemiteconservancy.org to find more inspiration. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to deepen the public's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. The North Cascades Institute has a large portfolio. It is an environmental learning center, training center, conference center, and leadership center, all set in the splendor of the North Cascades National Park Complex. Learn more at ncascades.org. Okay, we're back now with Jamie Rappaport Clark, the president and CEO of Defenders of Wildlife, talking about the um, fate of wildlife in the national park system. 
And now, Jamie, we've we've gone through the um, the predators, the the wolves, and the panthers. There's a lot of other um, wildlife issues out there across the national park system. For instance, woodland caribou. Once upon a time, they were native to Isle Royal National Park, and I, I believe they were native to North Cascades uh, National Park complex. Is that a species that we should actively try to return to those areas? Woodland caribou are hanging on by a thread in the United States. Um, that's one of those transboundary species that we share with Canada and absolutely deserve a shot at recovery. And it will take protected lands to expand the, the woodland caribou range, particularly south of uh, the Canada border. And there are lands that, that could support woodland caribou, for sure. Uh, but uh, another exacerbating influence on woodland caribou is climate change. And we can't deny the impacts of climate changing, uh, what's happening with climate on wildlife movement, on wildlife um, existence, and on wildlife's ability to thrive. And, and in that part of the Northern Rockies, they are really seeing pretty devastating and very real and accelerating impacts of climate change, which is affecting the woodland caribou as, as one of many species affected by climate change. Uh, another key species that uh, is going to be greatly affected, I fear, by climate change is, is the wolverine, which uh, really depends on the, the heavy snowpack and uh, whatnot to uh, survive. Right. Wolverine used to be a very secretive animal, for sure. Amazing. Uh, they call it the ghost bear, actually. Uh, but the wolverine, uh, Glacier National Park, uh, Cascades, uh, well known uh, in that part of the country. And you hit a really good species as a, as a signal or an ambassador or as a casualty, however you want to call it, of climate change. Without that snowpack, uh, and the ability for wolverine to move naturally in that northern rocky system, uh, I really fear for the long-term future of that species. Now, in talking about the future of just about any wildlife species, it depends, of course, on, on migrational corridors, as you noted. It is impacted by um, climate change and, of course, politics. Whether people like to discuss politics or not, it's, it's a fact of the matter that how we manage our public lands for sure has a direct impact on wildlife species and, and even plant species. And I guess the, the question has to be is, do, do you think that we have the political will as a nation to help these species survive? Because it seems every four years, every eight years, we get a change in administration in Washington and a change of philosophy and outlook in how these places should be managed. Um, regrettably, no. I don't think the political will is evident today uh, to save biological diversity for now and future generations. But we shouldn't accept that. We shouldn't accept my premise here. Um, we have an American public that feels very strongly about conservation, uh, feels very strongly about strong bedrock environmental laws like the Endangered Species Act, and feels absolutely unequivocally strongly about saving uh, these special places. And so we have to kind of square those kind of disconnects, whether it's climate change or the Endangered Species Act or um, maintaining our public lands. And I mean public lands, they belong to all of us for the purposes which they were set aside, which is conservation, public enjoyment. Those are issues that should not be subject to politics uh, political debate. They are American values. And, and I believe really strongly that we need to kind of remember why these lands were set aside or remember why we passed an Endangered Species Act 40 years ago. It was to preserve the unique natural condition of this country, to preserve the unique specialness of lands and wildlife for future generations. Uh, I, I often say you know, so goes nature, so goes us. And we are inextricably connected to the quality of our environment. And uh, we are playing um, a, a reckless game with uh, the future of uh, our, our, our own self uh, with the way that we are just politically throwing around some of these important areas. You know, uh, uh, these public lands are just energy dominance on public lands, uh, particularly national wildlife refuges, national parks, um, extraction industries. 
that is not a sustainable business model for, for environmental security. Yeah. Weakening the Endangered Species Act is only going to condone extinction. It's not going to solve the biological diversity crisis or stabilize uh, an economic future for society. So it's, um, I'm very concerned about politics inside Washington right now. It's not favorable for species conservation or public lands management. Now, now, certainly over the, the decades, there have been successes with wildlife. The bald eagle has come back. The, the peregrine falcon has come back. Uh, condors seem to be making greater and greater strides in the Southwest. One species that has made a remarkable comeback and created a problem at the same time is the gray seal. Um, I think it was back in the 1970s that concerns over the demise of uh, gray seal populations led to a... Um, a ban on on their um, hunting, and they have rebounded so greatly that uh, at Cape Cod National Seashore, they they like to uh, come there in the the summertime and, and feed and, and haul ashore to to rest. And where the gray seal goes, the the great white shark goes. And we um, had some unfortunate incidents in recent years. There was a fatality at Cape Cod National Seashore last summer. It's an interesting problem we have there with the success of one species um, brings uh, human populations into danger, possibly. Right, right. Um, yeah, I, I, the gray seal situation uh, is, um, you're right in that kind of, I'm making air quotes here, but managing nature to some degree requires balance. And I, I talked earlier about coexistence, how we interact with nature with an increasingly uh, urban society and increasing numbers of us is really important. And how we share this planet with wildlife is incredibly important and challenging. Um, and uh, it requires kind of thought and respect and understanding of the world around us. And uh, it's, it's, um, there aren't trade-offs. We have to figure out how to coexist here. Are there some places where it's not a good idea to to help species recover? And for instance, the grizzly bear. I mean, they used to be in uh, the, the Rocky Mountains in Colorado and down in uh, the San Juan Mountains and, and even down um, maybe even in Grand Canyon National Park, that landscape. Should we try and put grizzly bears back in those areas or, or is that uh, asking for too much? It depends. Uh, uh, if we're talking about grizzly bears, uh, uh, grizzly bears... We should work to bring grizzly bears back into suitable habitat where they can thrive and interact and be grizzly bears. Does that mean every acre of historic habitat? That's not very pragmatic and it's pretty idealistic. And so that's probably inappropriate. But the recovery trajectory and the recovery planning for grizzly bears has mapped out areas of habitat suitability where scientists and stake, other stakeholders believe that grizzly bears can coexist and thrive and be functioning parts of the ecosystem. So it's not just the grizzly bear. It's not just the gray wolf. These are apex predators that are indicators of the entire health of the ecosystem. And they, they play huge roles in the importance and the significance and the health of entire systems. So they're important parts. It's not the grizzly bear in isolation. It's the role they play in uh, the environmental health of the areas that they occupy. We've been talking today with Jamie Rappaport-Clark, the president and CEO of Defenders of Wildlife on the state of wildlife in the national park system. Jamie, I'm afraid that's all the time we have today, but I certainly appreciate uh, the time you've carved out for us. And uh, hopefully down the road, we can uh, reconnect and and talk about uh, perhaps uh, a couple specific species and and efforts to uh, make them healthier. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. Show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. 
Dry Tortugas National Park, 70 miles from Key West, just very well might be the most remote national park in the lower 48. But when you arrive, you're surrounded by crystalline waters for snorkeling, kayaking, and relaxing on pristine beaches. There are sunken wrecks to explore, coral reefs swarming with colorful marine life, and history in the brick walls of a Civil War era fort. The Yankee Freedom 3, departing from Key West, can get you there in a little more than two hours. Visit them at drytortugas.com. The winter of 2018-2019 was really quite vigorous in terms of snowfall for the Colorado River Basin and the Sierra in California. And that bodes well not only for the thirsty states those basins cover, but for river runners. With that in mind, we decided to call Steve Markle, the Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Oars, a longtime supporter of the Traveler, to get the outlook for this summer's whitewater adventures. For those who don't know, Oars is an outdoor adventure company that long has run not only the brand name Whitewater Rivers of the United States, but rivers throughout the world. Hi, Steve. Thanks for making time today. Hi, Kurt. Thanks for having me. So, um, as I mentioned, and as I'm sure you well know, it's been quite the um, bountiful winter in terms of snowpack, and that's got to bode well for some of your, uh, your river trips. If you don't mind, why don't we start over here in the Rockies, where the upper Colorado River Basin um, snowpack was 227% as of this morning. H- how does that translate into um, your, your river running forecast for um, the Colorado River and the Green and, and even the Yampa? Well, it's a subtle blend of excitement and caution. So when when rivers uh, have the potential to get as big as they will this year, uh, we, we're we're super excited to have that opportunity to run high water trips and to have, in a lot of cases, extended seasons. But we're also super tuned in to the fact that conditions can be more risky. And so really training and preparing is the name of the game. But um, yeah, we're looking at just over 100% of snowpack across the West in essentially every river drainage that we run. Uh, and I can't remember a time when it's been that good, at least in the last 17, 18 years. Yeah. Years ago in the last century, um, during my college days, I actually was a a river guide back east. And so I know that um, when you get a lot of runoff, sometimes that makes uh, rapids, shall we say, more dangerous or more exciting rather, or it can wash them out. How does the Colorado snowpack translate to, say, Cataract Canyon? Because I know that's one of the most exciting stretches in the park system for river running. Sure. Yeah, as um, as you know, but many people don't, Cataract Canyon during high water is essentially the biggest whitewater in North America. It uh, dwarfs the rapids in Grand Canyon. This year, we're expecting to see a peak around 57,000 cubic feet per second in Cataract Canyon. Uh, that is likely to come in early June. Right now, it looks like the Colorado River through Cataract Canyon is running around 20 to 25, maybe 30,000 CFS, and that's that's high. So when we're out there gearing up for high water, we're running high water. You know, we want to have motorized support boats out there. Uh, we want to have guides who are bringing their A game and guests who are prepared for the situation. Uh, they're getting themselves into, which is, you know, just a rowdy, good time. Uh, there is really no better place to be than Cataract Canyon at high water. But people need to be prepared for a potential swim. Water's cold. And yeah, we just, we don't want to take it too lightly. Yeah, yeah. Now, can you um, add additional trips based on um, interest in, in running Cataract Canyon uh, or, or any river, frankly? Or, or are you limited by your permit situation? Every river is a little different, but generally we are limited by permits. So in Cataract Canyon, we typically offer two trips per week, April through October. And uh, that seems to be more than adequate in terms of overall availability. You know, spring and in going into high water is, is arguably, you know, one of the best times to be out there in Canyonlands on the Colorado River through Cataract Canyon. Uh, it's it tends to be a little cooler. We've got waterfalls flowing. 
right now wildflowers are going off it's just a it's a great time it gets pretty hot in the summer as most people know and then in the fall uh cools down a bit with much more mellow flows so um yeah if you're looking for a more moderate uh adventure that doesn't involve high water cataract canyon should be back to you know kind of a normal summer flow in the maybe 10,000 cubic feet per second range by late July, early August, and well into October. Now, the Green River through uh, Gates of Lador and Dinosaur National Monument, how does the high water impact that? Because obviously you've got Flaming Gorge Reservoir upstream, and they, they kind of control the flows that are coming out of there. But with a, a high snowpack, might they um, let loose more water? So the, the Green River drainage this year is basically just an average snowpack. It's it's at just over 100%, but not the, the wildly above average uh, levels that we're seeing in, in a lot of other areas. And because it is dam controlled, uh, it's far more predictable. And basically what we're being told right now, and this is all subject to what the weather does over the next few weeks, but we can expect releases from Flaming Gorge in the range of 8,000 cubic feet per second through June 30th. So that is high water, and we'll be increasing our minimum age on the Green River through the gates of Lador. But you know we'll bring that back down to uh, seven years old when we get to July 1st. And it's it's also it's a great time. It's a beautiful section of river. We've had you know photographers go out there and and compare it to Grand Canyon in terms of overall scenery. Uh, but it's this great little trip that fits into you know four or five days. And, you know, perfect trip for people who might maybe only want to camp for a few nights. And the Whitewater's pretty consistently class two, three, uh, and a little bit more rowdy at um, at high water. But um, still a pretty perfect trip for even first-timers. Yeah, as far as scenery, it, it's really hard to to pick one uh, one river in the Rockies over the other. I mean, the, the Yampa is a beautiful, gorgeous river, the Cataract Canyon, and Green River, as you mentioned, of course. The, the big canyon down through Grand Canyon National Park, uh, scenery is just breathtaking. Now, if you head farther west into California and the Sierra, I, I noticed that uh, the Merced River Basin, the snowpack's about 160%, 160, and in the Tuolumne Basin, it's about 149%, so that's got to be kind of exciting. It is. Uh, I was just in Yosemite uh, earlier this week. I took an afternoon off, and, and we're based just an hour and a half from Yosemite, so it's uh, it's an easy easy trip for us, but um, took the family over, and the waterfalls are just cranking. And it's such a beautiful time to be in the parks, especially this time of year when midweek there's not as many people visiting, traffic's not as bad, and the waterfalls are just gorgeous. Everything's green and in bloom. So yeah, we're we're enjoying a a kind of perfect California season so far. The Tuolumne River, which is arguably the best rafting trip in in North America, when you look at short rafting trips, one to three days is typically what we we run on the Tuolumne. It's essentially nonstop class three four rapids for eighteen miles, and it's a beautiful remote canyon, only three hours from San Francisco, but basically a world away. And it's big right now. We just had a trip out yesterday. It was about 10,000 CFS and in a pretty narrow canyon. That's a very, very exciting flow. There's there's not a lot of eddies, not too many places to pull the boat over or slow down. So it's just kind of go, go, go. But yeah, it's, a, it's an exciting time. And, you know, you mentioned earlier, some some rapids wash out and some rapids will get more complicated um, at higher water. Well, 10,000 CFS is a pretty ideal flow for adventurous rafters. You get a little bit lower than that and it gets a little bit more technically challenging. So right now it's at a great level. Uh, to, to give you some perspective, the Tuolumne, like an average summer flow on the Tuolumne is probably 11, 1200 cubic feet per second. So it's essentially 10 times the flow right now. And we expect that to last whew, probably into the first or second week of June and maybe hovering in that 8,000 to 10,000 plus cubic feet per second range. But for people in California or even making a visit out to California, that's that's 
a river worth checking out. And the Merced is also a super fun one day trip, a little bit further south coming out of Yosemite uh, along Highway 140. It's uh, class three, four, but it gets big right now. It's, it's running at about 7,000 cubic feet per second. Uh, it will get bigger than that as all that snow continues to melt. And I mean, it can have waves as big as the Grand Canyon as it gets up above 10, 15,000 cubic feet per second. And it's just a really fun kind of roller coaster ride. And it does mellow out a little bit as we get into later June and, and July. And maybe the best thing about a big snowpack year in Yosemite is the fact that it extends our season on the Merced River. So typically our season would be wrapping up by the end of June on the Merced River, just when a lot of visitors are, are coming into the park. But this year we expect to run all the way through July and, and maybe even into August, depending on how the melt happens. Boy, that, that'd certainly be a treat for uh, people who are coming out and want to cool off and uh, have a, a great time. Well, Steve, I appreciate it. We've been talking with Steve Markle, the Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Oars, to get a preview of what the whitewater season is going to look like this summer in uh, the Rockies as well as uh, out around Yosemite National Park. Steve, thanks so much for your time today. Thanks, Gary. I appreciate it. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It is also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference at friendsofacadia.org. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the National Park System for decades to come. See their successes at www.gtnpf.org. During my swing through the Alabama National Park sites, I visited the Tuskegee Institute and the Tuskegee Airmen National Historic Site, connected both geographically as well as in time. If you at all follow the ins and outs of modern agriculture, it's nearly impossible not to know the name George Washington Carver. Born around the time the Civil War was ending, he lost his mother in Missouri when slave raiders literally stole her away. In fact, he had to be bought back with a racehorse. Though it's often noted that he was ill and frail as a kid, he developed this intense curiosity about the world around him. Carver eventually became one of the most famous scientists of the 20th century, known especially for his work developing products from peanuts. And yet, at the Tuskegee Institute National Historic Site, I first learned that he was also an artist. The National Historic Site centers around the historic part of the campus and also around the George W. Carver Museum and its focus on Carver himself. The Tuskegee Institute was founded in 1881 for African-American students by Booker T. Washington. And this private university still educates young men and women on a range of subjects. In fact, Booker T. Washington's campus home still stands, open for tours Tuesday through Saturday. Personally, I like museums. I always have. I like walking slowly from one exhibit to the next, reading most of the text, if not every word, examining the photographs, touching any object offered to me. What I appreciated most about the displays at the George W. Carver Museum, they showcased a complete person, not just his professional image. Driven towards higher education, Carver pursued a PhD, determined to create things that would help the people around him. Eventually working at the Institute for over 40 years, he developed hundreds of products, investigated soil depletion and ways to rectify it through crop rotation, and mentored students and farmers alike. All the while, 
he continued to paint, often with pigments he developed himself. Widely recognized across the country for his work, he both established the reputation of the Tuskegee Institute and opened doors for African-American researchers coming behind him. Just down the road from the Institute sits the Tuskegee Airmen National Historic Site, linked to the campus during World War II when cadets stayed at the college while training to be pilots at Moton Field. My husband and I parked and walked to a grassy overlook. Beneath us sat two hangars and a handful of restored buildings, once essential components of Moton Field. Surrounded by forest, the historic landing is now adjacent to a working airstrip, and the planes taking off and landing filled the sky with similar sounds and silhouettes from what the cadets, mechanics, civilians, and more saw during World War II training. Before the onset of the Second World War, African-American men were not allowed to serve in the armed forces. Civil rights advocates on the domestic front fought for the right for African-Americans to serve. And, quote, the Tuskegee Airmen sprang from an experiment conducted by the U.S. Army Corps to see if Negroes, primarily African-Americans, had the mental and physical capabilities to lead, fly military aircraft, and the courage to fight in war, end quote. Yep. Americans doubted the ability of their fellow Americans to fight for their country. If it makes you angry, it should. It made us angry as we walked downhill to enter the hangars and made the courage of the first class of Tuskegee Airmen and support staff that much more impressive. This program is about Tuskegee Institute staff at Moton Field. Press a number at any time to make a selection. The first hangar contained two full-size training planes bright yellow, blue, and shiny beneath the lights. Speakers in the ceiling pumped sounds the cadets must have heard as they milled about the hangar, waiting for their training flights. Situated along the wall sat rotary phones. When I picked one up, I could hear the voices of real Tuskegee Airmen, recorded at the turn of the 21st century to protect their memories for posterity. Each student presents a little different problem. Well, he's a different individual based on what your instincts are. Structurally, the planes actually feel incredibly fragile. In fact, I learned that fabric was used to create the wings. Fabric strengthens using a strange substance into a plastic-like hardness. Now I really thought early pilots were brave. The second hangar included a large museum, one plane hanging from the ceiling. Videos with interviews and images from the Tuskegee Airmen deployments, training on the home front, and domestic civil rights efforts ran in tandem with the surrounding information and artifacts. Importantly, both hangars included information on the women who also worked at Moulton Field, including nurses, food vendors, and parachute riggers. Though my husband and I visited on a Friday during the day, about a dozen people milled about, reading and thinking. Perhaps it sounds dumb to say, but there is a lot of history out there. So much of what happens in large, multi-generational experiences like world wars or disasters is eventually subsumed into one general narrative or specific stories used to highlight the experience of everyone. For example, how many of us know about the game of Christmas football played among countries at the height of World War I, or can conjure up images of the D-Day beaches? Probably everyone. By preserving these hangars and planes, opening up museums, and providing ranger-led tours and talks to the public, the National Park Service and its supporters are making sure that Tuskegee Airmen and all who worked with them are kept front and center in the story of World War II, as they deserve to be. When I think of their service, I don't remember a paragraph in a textbook, but thanks to the historic site, I literally picture their faces, their equipment, their surroundings. I can hear their voices. I've touched the wool uniforms they once wore. Through the Tuskegee Institute and Tuskegee Airmen National Historic Sites, the past lives for me, and I won't forget. This is Erica Zambello in Northwest Florida. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. For National Parks Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck. See you in the parks. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. 
Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Park's Travelers podcast. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.